If you take a moment to think about the best video games out there right now, it may be a very fuzzy picture. Did you ever expect a $30 budget game to rise to the top of the Steam charts? Or think you'd ever see an indie game about building stuff become one of the greatest success stories of all time? And are you shocked to hear that the beloved Bayonetta didn't sell well, despite it being a fan favorite? The truth of the matter is that there are no guarantees in this industry. Any game can outperform any other. You could forget about the price tag slapped on any of them. So many people are out there, millions of people playing all manner of video games in every corner of the world. What is the archetype, the common ground among video games? There is none. Games come in all shapes and sizes. But it wasn't always like this. The last five years have seen huge shifts in this industry. It's not just about the AAA game anymore. The good, the bad, the great and terrible, everything is flooding in and the amount of games available only grows every year. How many of them are AAA games? The $60 game doesn't come out that often. In fact, we are often waiting for them, all the while hundreds of other games cross the finish line every day. The release of a highly anticipated AAA game is often an event, but what happens when those games don't make it out alive? In an era of cheap, free-to-play and mobile games, the pressure to keep costs low is real. After all, no company wants to spend $50 million on a game like L.A. Noire and then go bankrupt. L.A. Noire was actually one of my favorite games of all time, yet is symptomatic of a great irony in the video game market, the cult classic video game. Like many other games of its kind, such as God Hand, The Alice Games, Spec Ops The Line, and pretty much any yesteryear platformer akin to a game like Ukulele, these games have the worst fate. They are amazing games that just sell poorly. And it's not just because these games are niche either. There's another potion at work here, disguised as a harmless tonic, threatening the AAA market and forcing game makers to tread very lightly when considering that $60 price tag. When Hellblade came out this year, people started noticing that the so-called AA game was possible. This low-cost, miniature version of a AAA game was a fantastic idea. It offered all the trimmings of a $60 experience, the high-fidelity graphics, the Hollywood-style animation and voice acting, and a unique theme backed up by some really tight, fluid gameplay. It looked and played like a high-profile AAA game, but it was $30. Hellblade is the result of an adjustment being made by smart and perceptive video game publishers. It may have been the workings of a very talented development team, but its creation was to serve a greater cause. The influx of the free-to-play and the indie scene has put a lot of pressure on the traditional AAA game and its dominance at that $60 price point. According to Steam Spy, the average price of an indie game has dropped almost 20% during the last five years from about $11 to now $8.72 US. Furthermore, you can actually pick up these same games for even cheaper during sales and they often discount far more than standard AAA games. It's almost a race to the bottom, if you will, for many of these companies, seeing how far they can undercut games and still make ends meet. To challenge this movement, we often see AAA games cutting corners, lowering budgets and sadly, rushing games to the market. A game like Dishonored 2 is a great example of when a game is just pushed out the door way too quick. I have to assume it was not a condition of the game's funding, but instead the cheap, crowded gaming landscape forcing Bethesda to adopt the old mantra of, we can't afford to hold back the release any longer. Hellblade is a game that took a different approach though. Instead of trying to fight the competition, it simply met them halfway. It economized its offerings by bridging the gap between the two extreme points and cutting out all of its fluff. The filler included in many AAA games, don't you forget, raises development costs and in turn the final price of the game. Hellblade was a huge success because it was the perfect amount of game for what it asked for. It achieved what any developers are striving for, to find the perfect price point. After all, what does every $5 Steam game have in common? The answer being that these games may have been better off adopting a free-to-play model, but then again, we all know where that road leads to the overuse and exploitation of microtransactions. 
Either way though, they are undercutting themselves and diluting the crowded markets that AAA games are trying to find their way through. In response to this, it often forces AAA games into sticky, fight or flee situations. They can fight by gaining leverage, cramming microtransactions and that old familiar season pass to get a leg up, a safety net if you will. Or they can flee, from uncertainty that is, by refusing to develop an innovative game, to cannibalize themselves by playing it safe and milking franchises to death, or just copying everything else that's out there. A game like Nier Automata is a great example of a game that decided to take that risk. It was developed by Platinum Games, the masterminds behind some truly beautiful works of art, Bayonetta, Vanquish, Metal Gear Rising, and The Wonderful 101, among others. Does it surprise you to hear that they were on the verge of being shut down prior to the release of Nier Automata? Despite the religious followings and the critical acclaim of their games, they don't play well in the cutthroat world economy of this industry. The most successful franchises are built on accessibility and appealing to the most players, and in repeating what drew people to them in the first place. It doesn't matter if they are good games or not. Nier Automata is a game that is both great and fascinating, yet it's never going to be one of those games that everyone just runs out and buys. It's a game for gamers, to be appreciated by the select few who enjoy its weird, strong Japanese presentation and all of its quirks. But all of the praise and respect in the world doesn't fill up that corporate bank account the way a new Call of Duty does. The greatest paradox is the fact that these niche games are the ones that drive the industry forward. We see more innovation in the offerings of Platinum Games than we do for most other companies. Yet it's the space where companies go bankrupt and studios shut down as well. A body of enticing water where you just can't quite see below the surface and the dangers that are down there. How many games like Nier Automata and L.A. Noir do we really get? Are they the real heroes of this industry or are they blinded to the danger that just surrounds them? As the market continues to get saturated by cheap and free successful titles, these types of full-priced, innovative games may end up being endeavors too risky to consider. Is the downturn in video game prices forcing AAA companies to just play it safe, knowing that they could be just another victim if they stray too far from their trusted formulas? A shift may be on the horizon towards the more focused and specialized game to survive in a world where the most successful games keep getting cheaper, where the price crunch threatens the traditional market. Is the mini AAA game the future? It seems to be the natural remedy that would cure the anxiety of releasing an innovative $60 game such as L.A. Noir. Think of it this way. Would you rather have more slimmed and trimmed up creative games for $30 or the play it safe $60 game that stuffs itself to the brim with more of the same? Let me know what you guys think down below in the comment section by providing me with your opinions and thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to support the work I do on this channel, go ahead and subscribe to Downward Thrust, thumbs this video up and consider checking out my Patreon at patreon.com slash downward thrust. You guys have a great day and we'll see you in our next video.